Section 20 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlotli, by David R. Sparks. Chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 8. To be king amongst these people. A queer sensation tugged at Kirby's heart as he descended the steps with Naida at his right, and all of her, and his, dainty and gracious friends following after. Yet intense as his emotion was, never for a second was he able to doubt the evidence of his senses, which told him that all of this was real. As they descended the back steps of the tower, Naida's sweetness, her grace, the warm humanity of her, made him humble with gratitude for the extraordinary fortune which had come to him, an unromantic aviator born in Kansas. Then they were standing in the brilliant light of the amphitheatre, and the Duca, surrounded by his cacique, was advancing to meet them. It was not a long conference which followed. Kirby saw from the start that the Duca was indeed ready to come to terms. So treasured an object, it seemed, was the cylinder of gold, that the mere fact that Kirby possessed it made the Duca respect the possessor, whether he would or no. With this initial advantage it did not take long to make demands and win acceptance. It was agreed that some systematic campaign of extermination should be planned and carried out against the ape-men. Further, the project for eventually bringing other upper-world men into the realm was accepted. Most notable of all, it was agreed that while the Duca should retain a voice in the regulation of temporal affairs, Kirby should possess an absolute veto over his word. Naida said there must be some formal ceremony to celebrate Kirby's ascendancy to power. To this the Duca consented, and established the date as a fortnight hence, and the place as the temple on the plateau beyond the plateau of the castle, where the Ducas had been invested with their robes of state from time immemorial. At the end it was decided that little Elana should be left in the prayer chamber until a burial ceremony could be held on the morrow. In less than an hour, Kirby, Naida, and the others withdrew from the amphitheatre to return to the regular dwelling-places of the girls. Deep in his mind, Kirby did not know how sincere the Duca was, and fear lingered somehow, but he put it aside for the present. As they came out of the castle, proceeding in a gay procession across the drawbridge above the moat of beautiful aquatic plants, Kirby saw that the light from the glass sky was fading to a glow like that of spring twilight in the upper world. Naida answered his question about the phenomenon by saying the day and night in the cavern corresponded to the same period above. What quality of the glass sky gave out light she did not know, but it seemed definite that the element was sensitive to the presence of light in the upper world, and when the sun sank there the glow faded here. A flower-embroidered path led them around the castle to a group of little crystalline houses, all overgrown with bougainvillea vines and honeysuckle. In front of the first Naida paused, and while the others went on to the other houses she looked at Kirby. "'It is Alana's dwelling,' she said simply, "'and it will be vacant now. Alana would want you to take it. Will you, please?' The twilight was deepening swiftly. Kirby nodded reverently, then drew close to Naida. Naida? Yes? He took her hand. I can stay here. I can consent to become, after a fashion, a king, only if you will reign with me as queen. Will you, Naida? Will you love me as I have learned to love you during this single day in paradise? She did not answer, but presently Kirby's mind went blank for sheer joy, for then Naida raised her face, and he kissed her lips. It made no difference, then, that despite the day's victory Kirby could see trouble ahead, and feared, rather than rejoiced at, the Duca's too easy acceptance of terms. The future could take care of itself. This moment in the dusk belonged to him and Naida. The two weeks which passed for Kirby after that particular twilight sped quickly. During the first morning all attended the ceremony which was held for Elana's burial in the plot of gardened ground where lay her ancestors. Ensuing mornings were devoted to conferences in the amphitheatre with Duca and Cacique. After the fourth day Kirby, at Naida's insistence, moved into splendid quarters in the castle, a suite of chambers across the amphitheatre from those in which the Cacique dwelt. 
In practically forcing the move on Kirby, Naida won his consent finally by agreeing to have their wedding ceremony performed on the day of his coronation. Then she would come to the castle with him. The afternoons of that first fortnight before the wedding and coronation were spent in hunting and fishing. Also, Kirby and Naida visited often the aged people of the race, who dwelt in crystalline, vine-covered houses, like those of the girls, but removed from them. Naida's relatives were dead, but she had relatives there, and to all these aged ones, who sat living in the past, she did what she could to explain present developments in the affairs of the younger generation. Last but not least, Kirby set aside certain hours each afternoon which he devoted to the formation of a rifle squad among the girls. Six rifles he had, and in turn he trained each of the girls in their use, having set up a range at the foot of the plateau cliffs. The results he gained made him feel that the day would come soon enough when he would dare launch an offensive against the ape people and especially pleasing was the sense of power over the duca which he gained. The duca showed no sign of treachery. Yet Kirby did not trust him. Never did he quite forget the misgivings which had lingered in his mind after the first conclave. As for his relationship with Naida, that grew with every moment they could steal to spend with each other, and side by side with their growing knowledge of each other grew, for Kirby, an increasing store of knowledge of the realm. He learned, amongst other things, what seemed the origin of the worship of the serpent, Quetzalcoatl, amongst primitive Mexican races. The time had been when the people of the temple had mingled freely with the races above them, and that they might have ready means of egress to the world, they had built the tunnel through which Kirby had entered the valley of the geyser. Thus going and coming as they did, they had spread their cult of the worship of Quetzalcoatl, and when, eventually, Strife rose between the peoples of upper world and lower, and the people of the temple withdrew to their realm. They left behind them the serpent myth, which was to live through countless centuries. The tunnel, Naida said, had been abandoned when her people left the upper world once and for all, and its use for any reason prohibited. This Naida gave as the reason why none of them went near the tunnel now, and why the cylinder of gold had lain in the canyon undiscovered. It was the explanation she had promised on the day in the tower, when first she saw the cylinder. So the days passed, until the day set aside for wedding and coronation dawned. On that morning Kirby, having concluded a long conference with the Duca, was walking with Naida in the gardens outside the castle. "'Tell me,' he said to her, "'do you yourself believe that this serpent has the powers of a god?' Naida looked at him quickly, a sudden fright in her eyes. I believe the serpent exists today somewhere in the distant reaches of the chasm beyond the Rora forest. Yes, but do you believe the serpent is God? Actually frightened now, she looked swiftly about, but when she saw that they were alone, confidence returned. No, she exclaimed, I do not believe Quetzalcoatl is a god. I believe he is the most terrible creature anywhere in our realm, and that men first worshipped him through fear. I believe our race would be better a hundred times if they had never made him their god." Kirby whistled. "'Then you do not believe that the Dukas of past ages talked with him. You do not believe it was Quetzalcoatl's pleasure over the great diamond which made him cease preying on your people? No. Long habit makes me show respect for these myths, and adhere to the customs of our cult, but I do not believe. I think our race gained immunity for the serpent's ravages not through a compact with Quetzalcoatl, but because our builders were intelligent enough to erect the castle up here on the plateau where Quetzalcoatl could not reach them. To tell the truth, I think the whole cult is false and wrong, and I wish Quetzalcoatl were dead and gone from the world." Kirby smiled. In spite of Naida's reverence for certain features of the cult, he had long suspected that her true feelings were those she had just expressed and he was glad for this new bond of understanding between them. He glanced at her with understanding and perfect trust. Naida, since we have talked so frankly, there is one more thing which I must bring out. She looked up at him. What is it? The Duca. She drew closer, her perfumed body brushing his, her great eyes caressing him. Naida, I'm afraid of the man. And so am I, she confessed suddenly. It has all been too easy, Kirby said in a slow voice. 
There is no doubt whatever that our possession of the cylinder of gold has had great influence on the Duca, and yet— He paused, taking her hand. And yet, she went on for him, you do not believe he would have conceded what he has unless he intends to make trouble. Kirby nodded twice emphatically. Well, you have trained all of us to use the rifles. He smiled gravely at her understanding. Yes, I have, and your skill and that of the others with the rifles will always help us. Yet even so, closer still she drew now, and there was sadness in her eyes. I think I see, she said in a voice which choked. When do you think he will make a move to start trouble? Kirby hesitated, then drew a long breath. Today. On, on the day of our union, Naida echoed in dismay, can you tell where or how he will strike at us? Kirby shook his head. There are a hundred things he could do. Naida, I, I, well, somehow I am afraid of the ceremony this afternoon, the wedding ceremony. He felt a little shiver go through her, and he would have taken her in his arms save that a gay cry rang from the garden then. Naida, Naida, it was her cousin Nini, a bronze-haired youngster as elfin and puck-like as her name. I thought we should never find you. Do you realize this is your wedding day? and that you're acting as if there was nothing to be done?" Nina darted a mocking glance at Kirby, who grinned. "'Do come, Naida,' cried another girl. "'Your gown is ready, and we want you to ourselves for a while.' Other girls joined them, some singing and some carrying an obligato on the sweet flute-like instruments which Kirby had first heard as he hung in the throat of the geyser. In front of them all Kirby laughed and kissed Naida on the forehead, but as he took leave of her thus, he whispered, we must not let our guard relax for a second this afternoon, and I think there is a more definite precaution which I will take besides. CHAPTER Nine. Some hours later Kirby smiled with tight-lipped satisfaction at thought of that precaution which he had taken. What it was only he, Nini, Ivana, and three other girls knew, which secrecy pleased him as much as the precautionary measure itself. Seated alone in a dimly lighted, thick-walled cell of the ancient temple in which the dual ceremony of wedding and coronation would take place, he was waiting for the moment when the festivities would begin. Thus far the Duca had done nothing, yet Kirby's uneasiness would not leave him, and he continued to be thankful that, if trouble should start, the Duca might not find as many trumps in his hand as he expected. A couple of hours after Kirby had left Naida and the other girls in the garden, all had begun the two-mile journey from the castle to the small plateau on which stood this temple, where the ceremony would be held. Now, while Kirby waited alone, the Duca and his cacique had gone to another wing of the temple. Naida, attended by her bridesmaids, had been assigned to a cell of their own, and the rest of the girls were waiting in the nave of the temple. Unable to attend the walk from their plateau to this, the old people of the race had remained in their crystal houses. With ten minutes more to wait, Kirby rose from a bench on which he had been seated, and began to pace his cell. It was this archaic pile of stone, he finally decided, which was causing his depression. Unlike the bright and cheerful castle, this place, older than any other building in the realm, was squat, thick-walled, and gloomy. Here in the dusky cells which lined labyrinthine corridors, the early generations of the race had found protection from outside dangers, all of which was all right, Kirby thought, but just the same he wished he had insisted upon being wedded in the brilliant and cheerful amphitheatre. But presently he stopped pacing and faced the door of his cell. Then he breathed a sigh of relief. From down the twisting corridors which wound out into the central nave stole the high sweetness of soprano voices, the whisper of flutes, and the mellow resonance of little gongs of jade and gold. It was the signal for which he had waited. It had been the Duca's instructions that he should come out into the temple when the music began, and meet Naida there. Both would advance to the altar, and when they were in place, the Duca would come to them. Kirby, therefore, after a glance at the blue trousers and tunic of tanager scarlet which the girls had made for him, opened the door of his cell and stepped out. In a moment he traversed the windings of the corridor, and halted under a flat arch at one side of the temple nave. As he paused so, to await the appearance of Naida and her bridesmaids under a similar arch directly across the temple, he held his breath. Not even nymphs 
could be as graceful as were the twenty-six girls who were performing the dance of life immortal, which tradition decreed should be given before the ceremony by which in this realm two souls were wedded. The flash of rainbow gowns was like the swirling of light in a sky at dawning. The music of voices, flutes, and the little gongs of jade would have stirred the souls of the dead. If only the confounded sense of approaching disaster would leave him, Kirby thought grimly, this would be a magnificent moment. As it was, he turned his eyes away from the girls and began to examine the temple. Just as Naida had told him the case would be, he found both sides of the nave, surrounded by arches similar to the one under which he was standing. Everywhere, dim and tortuous corridors led to cells like the one he had just left. Then, in one end of the nave, loomed a closed door, from behind which the duca and cacique would appear when the couple to be wedded were in place before the altar. The altar itself, a rectangular mass of some jade-like stone, stood at a distance of perhaps twenty paces in front of the closed door. On top of the greenish stones, resting on a cushion of some crimson material, flashed the crown which would be used at the coronation. Kirby's eyes widened as he beheld a single rose-cut diamond, two inches in diameter, mounted in an exquisitely simple bandeau of wrought gold. But a moment later, even the crown which would be his, if nothing happened, seemed only a bauble compared to the other prize which he had won in this world beneath the world. Naida. He realized that the dance was ended, the music stilled, and that the rainbow-garbed girls had formed a double line in the center of the temple. Suddenly his heart beat fast, and for just a moment, as he dared look fully and deeply at Naida, and she smiled back at him across the distance, he even forgot to be depressed. But even as he advanced to meet her, his uneasiness returned. Now the girls were singing again their voices raised in a triumphant chorale, as beautiful as Naida's face with its warm red lips and smiling eyes, as beautiful as her wedding gown that might have been woven in its filminess of mist from the sea. The bridesmaids, silent, their lovely faces alight, paused, but Naida came on. From her floated to Kirby a fragrance more overwhelming than even the perfume of the geyser. Presently he felt her hand on his arm, and at last they stood side by side, now again his premonition of evil left him for a flash, but again it returned. "'I love you,' he whispered. "'I love you. But I am still afraid.' Naida's smile faded. "'And I, too. Oh, I've been terribly afraid. We will keep our guard.' "'Yes.' In front of them, on the altar, the crown diamond winked and shimmered in a dim light. The swelling chorus of triumph, in which the bridesmaids had joined now, made the whole temple ring. Slowly, while Naida moved easily beside him, Kirby began to march to the altar. Then it was done, and they were halted. After both of them had given a lingering glance at the crown, whose diamond shimmered now within their reach, they raised their eyes to the closed door behind the altar. The thing was swinging open. An inch it moved. Two inches. Kirby waited, never taking his eyes away from the widening crack. With a crashing final volume of sound, the chorus swept magnificently to its climax. Then the door was flung wide. Still Kirby stood stiffly before the altar, with Naida drawn up splendidly beside him. After two seconds, however, he moved. Duca and Cacique were not standing in the corridor. In the semi-darkness the only figures visible were squatting, grotesque things, whose bodies were covered with whitish hair, and whose leathery faces were disfigured by gashes of mouths filled with enormous teeth. A feeling of standing face to face with final disaster turned Kirby sick. As he jerked back from the altar, sweeping a paralyzed Naida with him, the ape men let out gibbering howls, half-human. With gigantic hopping strides, the foremost rank of the creatures swung forward, straight into the temple. End of chapters 8 and 9